not wasteful. So, uh, I'm going to read the scripture that someone just pointed out. Proverbs 16, verse 4. The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. So, um, I believe that God will even take something that isn't even working necessarily perfectly in his will and will use it to his advantage because he's not wasteful. Um, so, let's go over here to um, Isaiah chapter 14. Now, this is talking about Babylon. But we know in the book of Daniel that um, whenever the um, when the angel came to speak with Daniel, he says, I, I got stopped by the prince of Persia. So I believe that the prince of Persia, you don't, it's not going to be a man that stops an angel. So the prince of Persia is not a man. Prince of Persia is a power. It's a spiritual power. Over a nation. Okay? There's a spiritual power over a nation. There's powers and principalities. And they, if you, uh, according to Jewish tradition, Michael is the power and principality over the people of Israel. Okay? So the angel that, that they followed in the wilderness, the word Michael means who is like God. And I really mean that means like he is like God. You look at Michael, and he looks like God. That's why there's some confusion. It's, uh, in the Old Testament, it says that he was talking to the angel, but then in the next passage, it says, and he, and he was telling the Lord. So he was talking to the Lord, but he was talking to the angel. How could he be talking about the angel and still be talking to the Lord? It could be that the angel is like the Lord. And he's so much like the Lord that it looks like he's just talking to the Lord. And you couldn't really talk to the Lord. That's why whenever um, Moses was, whenever it says, uh, the Bible says that he talked to, that God rebuked Aaron and 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 his sister was his sister Miriam. Miriam. He rebuked Miriam and Aaron and says, "Why have you come against my servant Moses? When I talk to a prophet, I bring I, I show up in a vision or a dream. But with Moses, I talk to him face to face. Well, but then Moses in Exodus chapter thirty-two, I believe, he says, "God, show me your glory." And he says, "I will show you my face." And he goes, "I won't show you my face though. It'll be too much. I'll show you my backside." I believe Michael's probably the backside. Maybe. Just throwing it out there. I'm not saying that's absolute. I'm saying we're talking about some of these mysteries in the spiritual realm. I don't think we fully understand. And I believe that Michael, who is like God, who is like the Lord, Jehovah, okay, Yahweh, he is like him. And so, anyway... The power and principality of the nation. So Michael was the power and principality of Israel. Okay? And that's also why I believe they had the gods. They worshipped the different gods. Because they had powers and principalities over those nations. The Moabite um, god was Moab. I believe he was a power and principality. You have the Philistines and theirs was Baal. Baal. And Baal is above. The Lord of the Flies. Right? The, the god of the dead. Okay? So you have... These different gods. And he says, you are whoring after these other nations. You're worshiping these other gods. But I set you apart. I gave you a different power and principality. I gave you a different rule, a reign, a different reign. You're not supposed to be underneath those gods. You're not supposed to be underneath those powers and principalities. But we only allow them, we only allow those powers and principalities in our lives when we submit to them. And we worship them. When we worship God, we have different Make sense? So the power and principality, I believe that we that nations have powers and principalities based off the book of Daniel when Daniel was praying and it says the angel of the Lord came to him and says, I was on my way, but I got hung up by the prince of Persia. But Michael came and helped me and relieved me. So then the angel came and gave Daniel the message because Michael came and intervened and fought against the prince of Persia. Very interesting. Hierarchy. Yeah. It's awesome. All right. So. What? Hierarchy. Oh, yeah. And that's what it means to me. If you have a principality, then you have ranking systems. It's just something to yeah. think about. Very interesting. Power and principality. So, Babylon, I, I, this is how I believe that the Babylon, that Babylon is the, has a power and principality as well. 
okay? And if you read the King James Version, it says Lucifer. Now, we have a lot of things. Yeah. Really? Yeah, in fact, and now there's different, there's a bunch of different of these things. I don't, I don't, you know, we talk about Satan. The word Satan means accuser of the brethren. That's what Satan means. Okay. There's different ones. There's, look, we have different names. Now, this guy could possibly have different names. Who knows? I don't know. I don't know all the depths of the spiritual realm, okay? I'm just going to say that right now. I don't. I just know what the scripture says. And I'm trying not to get into other books that talk about different things. But I do know this. That the scripture says, um, I'll mention one thing about the book of Enoch. The book of Enoch says there's a guy named Azazel. It says all, all sin will be ascribed to Azazel. And the only reason why I'm mentioning Azazel is because in the book of Leviticus, I believe it's chapter 16, it talks about how they sacrificed one goat to the Lord for atonement for their sin. And they took another one and passed the sins on him and sent him out into the wilderness to Azazel. And Azazel is traditionally, under even Jewish tradition, is an angel. And that angel, according to that tra Jewish tradition, was bound up underneath the earth. And so they sent him, they sent all that, that, that sin out into the wilderness on the scapegoat to him to carry the sins out to that being that was bound up. How do you spell Azazel? Azazel. Let me look at that real quick. I saw they said scapegoat in here, but I don't think they named him. At least in mine. But it is apparently a fallen angel, and actually, it is the goat god. Okay, <laughs> is the goat god. Now, when you look at when you have all the pictures, and they, they have the pictures of the of the guy with the horns and the hood, foot, and the pitchfork and the tail, that's the goat god. That's Zazel. Yes. Now, whether that's true or not, I have no idea. <laughs> okay, it is true. Okay. I'm saying there's the scripture doesn't our our given scripture doesn't have enough evidence in it for me to back all that up. Make sense? You would have to read extra biblical books if you if you were trying to have a different understanding of some of these traditions that people have and where they got them from. But the scriptures that we have do not teach about who Azazel is. It, you can't find it anywhere. Okay? So the only authority I can say about it is there is a being, according to the book of Leviticus, named Azazel, that they sent the sin out to. So according to Leviticus, they passed the sins onto the scapegoat, and the goat went out into the wilderness to carry the sins out to Azazel, this other being that was not God, a different being, whatever that is. And I, and it has to do, and I'm convinced that it, I'm convinced that it is, they were carrying the sins out to him so he could take those sins it's because he it was his fault he was taking the blame make sense the scapegoat hmm. so you said lucifer and that's in the levitical law that is the law that's not even tradition that's law they had to send out the scapegoat to azazel whoever that is so you're saying that like different names or for whatever but like you said lucifer was over Babylon and like is that how the trying to because there could be different names because there's many Satans many accusers and like, just, so it, yes well the, the the idea of many Satans does come from the book of Enoch okay so did, now the idea of Antichrist being many Antichrist yeah, okay. that is in the New Testament yeah. so and I do believe that we we're, I'm, I'm convinced I think everybody's convinced that there's there was a legion of demons in that man so we know there are Hundreds of these things, okay? What they are, how they operate, that's the mystery. Yes, sir? Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. Is it necessary to even know what the ranks are? Because I'm pretty sure it's powers, principalities, rulers, authorities, thrones. And I don't think it's necessary for us to function as Christians. All we need to know is that we have authority over them. Right. <laughs> All right, so I'm explaining a few things to help us understand a few things to help us go a little deeper, but... Yes, you don't have to understand all the details of it. It's interesting, but 
we don't have to. All right. We do need to understand that the powers and principalities exist to understand the next part I'm about to read because it, it talks about this judgment against this being. And a lot of people have interpreted it as Satan, this Satan. There's only one, but there's not only one. That's the thing. There are powers and principalities. The scripture says that in Ephesians, that our b battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the powers and principalities of this dark world and the prince of the power of the air. You see, so we have... There, there is a spiritual realm that rules over this world. The scripture says in 1 John, for the, we are sons of God, but the entire world is under the control of the evil one. So if we don't understand that, we don't know that we have a war to fight. We don't know how we have a battle to fight. But we, don't, we just sit there and pretend that they don't exist at all. And that's the danger of going the opposite realm. I grew up in church that they didn't ever talk about demons. They never talked about, they talked about Satan and pretty much all Satan ever did was tempt you to do evil. They didn't talk about the, the power of the devil. They didn't talk about how he had power. And a lot of people will say, well, he doesn't have power. Well, he does have power. We have more power. That's what we need to know. He does have power. We have more power. And we, but people, if, if I told my, I remember uh, talking to someone that I love very dearly. And I said, you know, it was my dad. I told my dad, I said, uh, I said, you know, part of the problem that we've had People don't want to acknowledge witchcraft. They don't want to acknowledge the power, these powers. Um, we've, you know, grown up believing that they don't exist. Witches aren't real. They are real. Witches are real. If you look in the Old Testament, it's very clear that they that witches were that witchcraft was real. That that there were necromancers. There was mediums. All that stuff. All real witchcraft. You know why we don't want to acknowledge that they're real? Because if we acknowledge that they're real, we'd have to acknowledge that we had more power over them. And that God was more powerful. And that we'd have to expect him to move. But we have a hard time believing God's going to move. So we want to pretend all supernatural things aren't there. And it's wrong. It's all in there. It's all in there. They brought, didn't Nathan come back through a medium? Oh, something? yeah. That was crazy. In <laughs> fact, Nathan, it wasn't Nathan. It was Samuel. Samuel. Um, Saul came and was like, I need to seek counsel from the prophet Samuel. But Samuel was dead. So where would he go? He went to a medium. And the medium was like, look. There was a decree made by King Saul that um, we can't be around here and we can't be here. So what are, you, what are you trying to deceive me and get me killed or whatever? And he's like, no, nothing will happen to you. Of course, Saul's pretending to be somebody else. She doesn't know it's Saul. And so she pulls up the prophet Samuel from the dead. Samuel. Yeah. The prophet Samuel from the dead. I don't understand it. I don't get it. And then Samuel rebukes Saul from the dead. <laughs> he's like, hey, look. Um... He's like, didn't I tell you to, to kill all the, all the mediums and get rid of all the mediums? And so then uh, he says, because you've done this, then you, you shall die. So then, then Saul dies the next chapter or so. And David comes and becomes king. Of course, the medium is all freaking out. She's like, oh, no. It's like, you deceived me, you know. <laughs> but anyway. So, yes, uh, there are definitely um, powers and principalities. We have um, supernatural things going on, power, mediums. Uh, I think the difference between what a prophet is and what these other people are is that it's the source of your power. It, are you getting the source of your power from God and he's giving you this authority as a man to operate this in such a way on earth? Or are we getting our training from a devil? You know, so interesting stuff. Rogue devil. We're talking about rogue devils. We're talking about powers and principalities. So let's try to erase some, some things on this board. No? Rogue devil. It's redundant. Yeah. Well, <laughs> think about it. We read in Isaiah 54, he created the weapon for its purpose. So we think that we're seeing that even in Proverbs that he, he um, made everything for its purpose, even the, the wicked for the day of judgment. So we're seeing that the devil has a purpose, that God's using the devil for a purpose. And I believe it's for judgment of sin on the earth. All right. That's why he's the accuser of the brethren. The word Satan literally means accuser of the brethren. So we, we know that he's the accuser. He has a purpose. That's to reveal sin. That's part of his purpose. Um, but in Isaiah, check this out. Let's go to Isaiah 14, I believe. Powers and principalities. So in Isaiah, Isaiah 14, it's talking about Babylon. Okay? Straight up talking about Babylon. But he names a power and a principality in the passage about Babylon. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of, son of dawn. 
and some translations say Lucifer. Where at? Which one? Verse 12. Chapter 14, verse 12. Okay. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. And when you see the word stars, oftentimes that means angels, angelic beings, and heavenly hosts. Stars oftentimes are referred to as angels, okay? I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. Those who see you will stare at you and ponder over you. Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a desert and overthrew its cities, who did not let his prisoners go home? All the kingdoms of the nations lie in glory, each in his own tomb. But you are cast out, away from your grave like a loathed branch, clothed the slain, those pierced by the sword, who go down to the stones of the pit like a dead body, trampled underfoot. Okay. So, um, anyway, so it's talking about Babylon, but it seems to be interlacing this power and principality underneath Babylon, okay? And many biblical scholars believe this is talking about Satan himself, okay? Because of the word Lucifer. But mine says, O Daystar, son of dawn. So, don't fully understand it. I don't feel like it explains it well enough, but I, I believe that it's talking about a power and principality, just like when Daniel came to him with when Gabriel came to Daniel and told him I was held up by the by the prince of Persia, but Michael came and relieved me, and now I'm on my way. So, I believe that Babylon, the prince, there was a prince of Persia, a power and principality. I believe there's also a prince of power, a, 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 a power and principality over Babylon, and that one's name is Lucifer or the Day Star, whatever you want to call it. Um, Son of Don. So, very interesting stuff. Uh, so, powers and principalities. I don't know how why we went that direction. Do you remember why we went in that direction? Oh, because the because Isaiah fifty four says I created the weapon for its purpose, and so we were trying to talk about how even that weapon. We we're saying I believe it's a rogue devil. Because God used the power and principality of Babylon to pass judgment on the earth. But apparently, he exalted himself above God. He was trying to be like the Most High. And so he was saying, I'm going to pass judgment on you now. And that's why I believe God made hell for the devil and his angels. <clears throat> Very interesting stuff. Cool? So, um, God says he'll no longer be angry with us. Okay, so... We're talking about, uh, let's go over there to Isaiah 54 again. Finish what we're, what we're saying there. Move on. So I have also created the ravagers to destroy. No weapon that's fashioned against you shall succeed. You shall review every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their vindication from me, declares the Lord. Okay, so we see that if we're in covenant with God, if we're in established relationship with him, then we don't have to fear this judgment. Make sense? <clears throat> but if you're on the outside, then we have an issue. Okay? Now, oftentimes people will use that passage, Isaiah 54, to say, see, God's no longer angry. But that doesn't that doesn't line up with the rest of Scripture, even in the New Testament. So now we're going to start talking about some New Testament stuff because a lot of people will say, well, this is, that was the Old Testament. What about the New Testament, Zach? So let's go over to Romans chapter 2. Or, yeah, Romans chapter 2. Verse 5. <clears throat> Let's just go to verse 1. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on one another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We well, you know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose a man, you, who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of, of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? See, how, how many times y'all y'all hear, the, the kindness of the Lord brings about repentance. It's just taken out of context. That scripture it doesn't supposed to say, you know, God's kindness will lead you to repentance. No, the God's kindness made a way for repentance. Because if God wasn't kind, you couldn't even repent. 
It's saying here, it's not talking about that. It's not the way this is actually worded. It's talking about sin and how God won't let sin go unpunished. He says, but you're taking advantage of the kindness of God. Once you know the kindness of God was meant to turn you to repentance. But you've missed it. But because of, because of you or your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Okay, so how do we read that scripture and start, start quoting, hey, the kindness of the Lord brings about repentance, and we preach it like that, and forget the second half of it that says, because you take advantage of God's love, you're storing up wrath for yourself. So we miss that. We miss that. We, we think that because of that scripture, we should never talk about the wrath of God. Like I've, I've heard so many people use that scripture to say, well, well uh, we can't talk about hell. We can't talk about hell. Don't talk about hell. The kindness of the Lord brings about repentance. But because of your heart and impenitent and heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be. It's the same passage. Like, how do we miss this? Because we pick and choose what we want to read. We pick and choose what we want to hear. We just want nice, comfortable Christianity. <laughs> that scripture is so misquoted that I forgot that that's what it said next. If I hadn't read it just now, I wouldn't even know it was there. Can I tell you it was the devil that brought me to repentance? <laughs> yeah? That's no lie. Yeah? Because of all, all the things, all the torment? And, yes. And you're like, I need help. Yes. That's right. If the kindness of the Lord was to bring about repentance in the way that people preach it, why does the Lord discipline those he loves? Discipline is correction. Discipline is supposed to rebuke you, to correct you, to get you to change your thinking, to get you to rethink. You can't humble yourself if you don't know the problem. If there is no problem, how can you humble yourself? So then is it wrong to say that God uses evil to accomplish his purpose? No, I think that um, in the Old Testament, God quite often used um, uh, what we consider evil to bring about repentance. If Jesus didn't even believe that, he wouldn't have created a whip and driven people out of the temple. Jesus was rebuking and he was whipping. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he hit some people. Turning the tables over. I mean, I remember seeing this little meme that says, next time somebody says WWJD, remember that fashioning a whip and driving people out of the and, 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 and turning over tables is in, within the realm of possibilities. <laughs> you know? Now, whenever the disciples asked him, should we call fire down from heaven? He says, you don't know what spirit you're, you're speaking from. I think the point is, like, what is, what is it that Jesus is trying to get? He wants us to repent. So fasting and whipping, flipping over tables didn't kill anybody, you know? It's very interesting stuff. I think that we have more authority than we really think. I think that if the disciples had called down fire, the fire would have come. But, but Jesus was trying to teach them a better way. We got to win the souls. Let's not kill everybody. Let's win them. You know, I, I think that the authority and the power and dominion that we have on the earth actually is a lot more than we ha than we know we have. I think that the the principles of faith escort certain power and dominion, you know? I mean, that's why we're going to read a few scriptures in the New Testament that really challenge the whole idea, a lot of these ideas we have in our in our lines of thinking, you know? All right, what do we have? Um, wrath of God. So, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works to those who by patience in well-doing, seek for glory and honor and immortality. He will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. It's pretty blanket. I mean, this is like, bam. 
This is this. The whole passage is about the judgment of God. It's not about the kindness of God. And people often they take this, take that one little lip out of it, and then like, let's just forget the rest of the passage. Let me quote to you Romans chapter two, verse four. In fact, I'm not even going to um, I'm not even going to quote the whole verse, just half the verse. No, God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. That's the second third of the, of the verse. The first part of that verse is, or do you presume, do you presume on the riches of his kindness? Basically, if you take advantage of the kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. It's a rebuke. This word, this verse right here is rebuking people who are in sin. Yet we want to use it all the time to say, Look, don't rebuke anybody in sin. Don't you know the kindness of the Lord is what brings about repentance? But right here, it is a rebuke. This is a rebuke. <laughs> Stop sinning! <laughs> Why are you taking advantage of God? Why are you taking advantage of His kindness? Don't you know His kindness is supposed to bring about repentance, not let you keep on sinning? So interesting how we, how we've drastically twisted the Scripture to make it a more comfortable gospel. And it's not right. It's wrong. It's it's wrong. It's evil. And it causes us to never talk about hell. You know, when the Bible says, do not judge, therefore you shall be judged. If you, In the measure you judge, you shall be judged. But first, get it says, take out the speck in your eye before you, and then you will see clearly to help your brother get the, log, the, the, the speck out of his eye. So if we realize that that passage is not telling us not to judge, it's telling us how to judge. How do you judge? You judge yourself first. Then you judge others. It's not saying don't judge at all. It's saying in the measure that you judge, you shall be judged. It's not saying we shouldn't judge. In fact, the scripture even says we'll judge angels. It's, let's look that one up real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3. It's talking about judging. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before, unrighteous, before the unrighteous instead of the saints? It's talking about your disputes. Go to one another. Let somebody judge you. Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial tri trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more, then, matters pertaining this life? So next time somebody tells you, you can't judge, say, I'm actually licensed to judge. <laughs> okay. Um, i got to get my little thing squared away before I get up there and get to the angel that, That's right. That's right. I'm working on it. All right, so we've <laughs> seen the wrath of God is being stored up. We've seen that the wrath of God is still a real thing. Just because Jesus came doesn't mean God ain't angry about sin. He hates sin. He doesn't want us to sin. Like, uh, no, if you're in Christ, he's not angry with you anymore. But outside of Christ, those people are in danger. If we don't... <laughs> he, God loves the world so much that he sent his son. That's the good news. Why is it good news? Because without Jesus, we're all dead. Like, we, how could a cure be good news without a sickness? We have to understand we have a big problem. God, we're not getting saved from sin. We're getting saved from God. It's the wrath of God. We're getting saved from the wrath of God. John chapter 3 verse 36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. John what? John 3, verse 36. <clears throat> Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Romans 5, verse 9. We are saved from the wrath of God. Not getting saved from hell. People want to say, well, God won't send people to hell. No, no, he's just going to be really angry at you. That is hell. See, people, like, they've really twisted theology in an effort to make God so good that he becomes evil because he won't judge sin. Like, to say God won't judge sin and send somebody to hell is to say that God is a liar. That is to say he's a liar. It's to contradict who God is. God will judge sin. So when we start saying, well, God won't send people to hell, we've really, we're really treading on some, uh, it's a, it can be borderline heretical. 
Yes, God is good, so good, he doesn't want you to go to hell. That's the truth. He paid the price. He paid the price so that you wouldn't have to go to hell. That's the goodness of God. But if we don't receive him, the wrath of God still remains on us. It's very important for us to know this. But because of your hard and impenitent hearts, oh, I already read that. that. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That is 1 John 4.10. This is the propitiation of our sins, and not for us only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So we know that God, he, he, pet, he took the sin of the entire world, but we have to operate in faith and believe that he did it. If we do it, then we're in it. We're, we've, we've been brought in. Let's go to Romans chapter 14, I mean, Revelation chapter 14, verse 10. Let's go to verse 9. Now, uh, uh, let's go to verse 8. Look, I'm not going to pretend to understand every little thing on here, but I'm, what I'm trying to point out is if people aren't in Christ, then this is what happens, okay? Another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all the nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. So anyone who's in sexual immorality is being affected by this power and principality. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in its image and receives the mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night. These worshipers of the beast in this image, and whoever receives the mark of its, hand, of its name. I believe that that mark is not necessarily the thing that's going to happen one day where you get, I don't think it has to do with microchips or nothing. I, I believe that it has to, this is me personally right now. And I'm not saying that I understand the revelation perfectly, but what I do know this, anytime that in, in, when you talk about the when you talk about the markets on the hand on the forehead, in the Old Testament they would cover up everything, except their hand and their forehead. Okay, so this wedding ring that I have on my hand, this is a sign on my hand. It's a mark on my hand, showing that I'm married to my wife, that I'm in covenant with her. So in Indian cultures they have a mark on their forehead, and that mark is designed. A woman has a little deal on her forehead. And that symbolizes her marriage covenant to her husband. So this, uh, when we talk about the mark on the hand and mark on the forehead, it's about covenant. Who are you in covenant? And the reason why it was on the forehand and on the hand on the forehead was because it was the only part that wasn't covered up. Everyone could see it. It wasn't a mark on the elbow because that's covered. Now nowadays we're all walking around half naked, but back then they had clothes on all the way to their wrist, all the way down to their feet. You know. So when he talked about a sign on the hand and a sign on the forehead, it was saying this will be, it says it, this will be like a sign on your hand. Let's look it up. There's actually a scripture that says that. This will be, it's in, it's in Leviticus. It says, this will be like a sign on your hand. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 13, verse 16. It's talking about the when they obey God. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them, right, on the four frontals of your of your forehead. Uh, so let's go over to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Keep your finger in Revelation. Deuteronomy 6, 8. I noticed that. <clears throat> you shall bind them. Okay, so it's this right here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie on down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as a frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. It's talking about the fact that you're entered into covenant with God. That these things that you do are going to... That you do for the for God as a sign of your covenant with Him, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. All of your soul, all your might, all your strength, all of your heart. You're pursuing God with everything you have. When you do that, it'll be so obvious to everybody else. It will be like you were tying something on your hand, and everybody saw the mark on your hand, and everybody saw the dot on your forehead. And said, oh, He belongs to the Lord. This is what God is saying. If you can't tell from the outside that you're a Christian, be sure that you've already received the mark of the beast. 
You've got to make, you have to break covenant with the devil and enter into covenant with God. And it needs to be so obvious. How do we know? Because you love him with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your might. If you love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might, it will be obvious that you belong to him. You will recognize them by their fruit. You make more than 32 banana friends in one day. <laughs> Makes sense? I don't believe the mark of the beast is such a scary thing as much as people really think. I believe that it has to do mainly with covenant. A sign on your hand, a sign on your forehead. A sign of your covenant. Who are you in covenant with? How do I know? Because you love that person with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. How do we know that? So what do you do in your life? If, do you love the world and what it has to offer? Or do you love God and what it has to offer? What he has to offer. It's a matter of pursuing him. With How do you know what, what you really love? By what you pursue. By the things you spend all your time on. With the things that you invest all your money in. Those are the things that you love. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. All right, so, uh, where are we at? Um, <laughs> Deuteronomy eleven eighteen is talking about, Fix these words of mine in your hearts. It's talking about the fact that you're, you're being consumed. You're consuming and you're being consumed by God. You're, you're consuming his word and he's consuming you. It's obvious that the whole point of the sign on your hand on your forehead is the fact that everyone will be able to tell who you belong to. That's what it's about. Well, guys, if you found this video to be educational and inspiring and uh, faith building, then give it that thumbs up, subscribe, hit the bell, share, Comment. You guys have a blessed day.